Howdy. Let's quickly recap week number eight of dynamics. We're moving fast. What we discussed this week was moving frames, was the topic of moving frames, in particular linear momentum balance in moving frames, and as a consequence of this, the concept of inertial forces or apparent forces, Coriolis, Euler, and which one am I missing? Centrifugal. And to begin slowly, the first thing we did is we talked about moving and rotating frames. And we established in general a very important relation between time derivatives in inertial frames at rest and rotating frames. And this is the following. If we assume that we have a rotating frame, which I'm going to call M, calligraphic M, and let's assume that we have an inertial, not moving frame, which I call C, as so a usual Cartesian frame, what we established was that the time derivative of some vector y can be anything, can be position, can be the velocity, can be you name it. Its actual time derivative, dot meaning the absolute real time derivative as seen, for example, in the Cartesian frame C. Whenever we use a subscript, that means seen in a certain frame, in this case seen in this Cartesian frame. Often we leave it out, which simply means the absolute, the real time derivative as seen by an inertial observer in a fixed reference frame. This is nothing else but the time derivative of that same vector, which a moving observer in this M frame would see. And so we put the dot, this, this circle on top, this open circle, as indicating it's the time derivative seen in the moving frame. But these are obviously not the same, so we need something else. And then something else is a correction, which we derived as the angular velocity of that moving frame cross this very vector y that we're referring to. And so the simplest example how one can maybe think about this is let's say that you're sitting on a rotating disk, right? The center is fixed. Here we assume that both frames have the same origin. And now, of course, you could draw some Cartesian frame here. Let's say this is our Cartesian frame E1C. E2C, this is inertial, this is fixed, this is not moving at all. But now the disk starts to move, and let's say this rotates with some angular velocity omega m. As a consequence, if you're somewhere on this thing, you're rotating. Let's assume that this disk has a groove, meaning it has a pipe or something over here, in which a particle can move back and forth, right? If there's a particle here, it can only slide inside this groove, but now, of course, this thing is also rotating with the angular velocity. If we now use a co-rotating reference frame, for example, let's say here is our E1m vector, and here is our E2m vector, and these two now rotate with the frame, we're seeing two different things. We, as an inertial observer, we see that this particle is moving outward in this pipe, or inward, or whatever, plus it's rotating. But if I'm sitting on the rotating frame, if I'm sitting at the center, I'm looking down the pipe, the only thing I see is this particle coming towards me or going away from me. So if I'm in the system, then the only velocity, for example, which I see is this, the position of the particle. So let's denote the position by some vector, which goes from here to here. This is my position vector r of the particle. And the velocity would be the time derivative. If I'm sitting on the system, the only velocity I'm seeing is this orange arrow here, because the only thing I see is this thing moving outward. And this is nothing else but the change in position as seen in the moving frame. It's that. On top of this, we have this rotation. If I do omega out of the plane, cross r vector, what I get is a second component, which is pointing this way. And this is exactly the second term. So this here is omega m cross r. And this is the velocity component we get because we're rotating. Any point that's rotating has a velocity pointing this way. Now if you add these two together, what comes out of that is a new vector. And this over here is the real velocity. That's the real time derivative. So here this is my real r dot measured in the Cartesian frame. So while I'm sitting on the disk and I only see the particle move towards or away from me, it's only moving in a radial direction, this is only partial, partially the truth, because there's another velocity component, which is the one because of the rotation, and the inertial observer, the one not sitting on the disk, would see the sum of the two. And that's nothing else but what this equation tells us. Keep in mind that this superscript m here indicates as seen in the moving frame for the derivative, and here that's simply the angular velocity of the moving frame. That's a vector equation which you can evaluate in any frame in principle. 
right? Because we, this is just, you know, vectors. It doesn't mean anything in terms of what components we're talking about. We can, for example, evaluate this now in the M frame. So if you want to do the cross product and you want to write this as whatever, 0, 0 something cross 1, 1, 5 or whatever the vectors are, for that you need to choose a frame in which to evaluate the components. And for that you can do anything. The most convenient one will be the M frame. So what we can do then is, for example, evaluate this in the M frame. So for each of these vectors we would express the vector components in the M frame and then we can carry out the cross product and so forth. But this by itself is a vector equation, not particular to any frame. Okay? So this means things moving in a moving frame. Now we use this derivative to derive what is the most important thing for this week, which is LMB in a moving frame. And here we realize that if I'm sitting in a moving frame, the physics are seemingly different as to what they are if I'm not sitting in a rotating frame, because we see these fictitious or inertial forces come up. In particular, if I have a little particle of mass capital M, what we've seen is that mass times acceleration equals sum of external forces. I think you probably cannot stamp this equation anymore because we have discussed it so many times. This is what we usually write. But now, if we're in a moving frame, the situation is a tiny bit different, because in a moving frame, we usually observe the acceleration only with respect to the moving frame, which means here, it would only be the acceleration out and in, in this barrel, and I don't see any of the rest. So this here is the acceleration as seen in the moving frame. Imagine you're sitting on the rotating thing, and you don't know that you're rotating. The acceleration, which you then observe, that's the acceleration seen in the moving frame. And that's, of course, still the sum of all external forces, but that's not everything because this is not the real acceleration. This is something related to this kind of stuff, but there's more to it. And because LMB applies in an inertial frame, when we derived this, we saw that extra terms pop up. For example, what we saw here is that there's a so-called Coriolis force. There is a so-called Euler force. And there is a so-called centrifugal force. And each of those enter because we're in the rotating frame. What are those? Well, the Coriolis force we derived, this was nothing else but minus two times the mass of the particle that we're you know, considering here. And here we need the angular velocity of the frame cross the velocity of the particle as or of the rigid body, I'm just writing center of mass, so it's general, it applies to both rigid bodies and particles and everything. And this is the velocity as seen in the moving frame. So again, if I'm sitting in the frame, I'm observing a certain velocity, this is the one I need to calculate the Coriolis force. And this one only exists if there is a relative motion in the moving frame. So for example, if you glue your particle at a certain distance here, it is rotating, but when I'm sitting on the rotating thing, I don't see a relative velocity because the particle is standing still. In that case, there is no Coriolis force acting. Similarly, the Euler force we derived in class as this was nothing else but minus m times, and here we need the angular acceleration of the frame, so the time derivative of its angular velocity cross the position of the particle and in the moving frame. In this particular case, this only comes to the picture if we have an angular acceleration. So if you're rotating with a constant angular velocity, this thing would also be zero, not all the force. Mm -hmm. Last not least, there's the centrifugal force, and here we derived this was nothing else but minus m times the angular velocity of the rotating frame cross the angular velocity cross the position as I see it in the moving frame. And we discussed that if we're in 2D, if we have a 2D rotation, and this simplifies a lot because omega cross omega cross r is, can be simplified. So in particular, if we're in 2D, right, and we know that our omega m is simply omega m times E3, and this thing lies in the plane, in the E1, E2 plane, then in particular, right, so, and in this case, E R C m lies in the E1, E2 plane, meaning it has no E3 component. If that is the case, and this simplifies because the whole thing, I should write it like this, the minus disappears and it becomes simply 
m times omega m squared times r c m. Which means this thing always points in the direction of the position of the particle. And there's one last thing that we shall not forget, because there's one more term that we need to consider. In principle, there's one more term, which is minus the mass times the acceleration of the origin of the moving frame. And this here is the moving, because of the moving origin. In our example here, we wouldn't have that because the origin is fixed. But imagine that this thing is rotating and at the same time it's also translating through space. Then the acceleration of the origin would also show up here. And this altogether is now nothing else but linear momentum balance in the moving reference frame. The nice thing about this is that we can evaluate everything in the moving frame. This is an acceleration as we see it in the moving frame, the velocity as we see it in the moving frame. These are angular velocities of the moving frame that we need to know, and these are just positions relatively seen in the moving frame. And then, of course, last but not least, what we do need are the external forces, but this term over here is just the same as always. It's the sum of all the real forces acting on the particle. And I stress that these are real forces because all of these guys back here are fake forces. Right? They are not really forces. They come in because I only consider what I see in the moving frame. For anyone who steps back and looks at this knot sitting on the rotating disk, but sitting next to the disk and observing what's happening, for them, you know, there will be no fake forces or so. It will just be F equals MA as usual. And for the person who's rotating with the disk, and they don't know that they're rotating, they will see funny physics happening. And that's because of these extra terms that come in. And these here are therefore what we call inertial or apparent forces, also called fictitious forces, because, like we said, they're not real forces. Now, why is all of this important, and how do we use this equation of L and B in the moving frame? If you are in a moving frame, yeah, when we are in a moving frame, what do we need to do if you want to consider this? So when in a moving frame, We do a few things. The first thing, of course, is we need to know the external forces. We need to know and to think about what are these external forces. It's just the same as always. Reaction forces, friction forces, gravity, whatnot. These are my real forces. Then what we need to do is, in this moving frame, we need to measure where is the particle in this moving frame relative to the origin of the M system. What's the velocity of the particle in that frame? as seen by someone who's moving with a frame. And all of this is with respect to the M-frame. These are vectors, but then of course you can evaluate the components, for example, in the M-frame again. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to know, or not we need to do, but what we need to know is we need to know how fast we're spinning. So we need to know the angular velocity of the frame, and we need to know the angular acceleration of the frame. And last but not least, we need to know if our origin is accelerating. But if we know all of these, we can plug this in and we can figure out, for example, how we're accelerating in the moving frame. One important note, and this is the last thing I want to say, is this again is a vector equation. So if we want to evaluate this in components, we need to choose a frame in order to write our components as, you know, 1, 2, 5, or whatnot. And to do this, we need to choose a convenient frame. And so the most important point is that we need to express all, you know, in some components, my pen is giving up soon, I'm sorry. And we need to do this whenever we use the equation up here. We need to express them all in the same frame. And typically, or usually, we would, of course, choose the moving frame, right? So usually, we write everything in the moving frame M. And then you can take your cross products and do whatever you want also in terms of components. So the most important thing for this week is when you're in a moving frame, moving frame means that either the origin is accelerating or the basis of that frame is rotating, or both, then things can be look different uh, or be different than they seem.
uh, if you're on the frame, and especially if you're sitting on the frame, you seem to be different physics as if you're sitting next to the frame and just observing from an inertial perspective. This is a non-inertial moving frame, and this is our LMB that we have to consider with the inertial forces in here. That's it for now. Thanks and ciao.